Hey all and welcome to another awesome tutorial. In today's video, I'll step you through the process of not only building the Walters Lighthouse, but I'll also show you how to create a fantastic little seaside diorama with a rocky cliff face and some seawater at the bottom. There are quite a few steps in making this model, so let's not waste any more time and get started building. As mentioned, this is the Rocky Point Lighthouse kit from Walters. It's a simple kit to build, so simple in fact that I didn't need to reference the instructions, but they are there if you need them. The kit also comes with a base, but I won't be using it. You'll need some basic tools to get started. Files, hobby knife and some quality sprue cutters. Each piece is carefully removed and any excess sprue is removed and the edges filed clean. To remove obvious seam lines like this, you can lightly drag the hobby knife over the area. This gently scrapes away a small amount of plastic until the seam line has completely been removed. The main lighthouse tower had this same problem and the seam lines were removed the same way. To straighten warped parts like the wall sections here, I first placed them in some hot water. After several minutes I removed the parts, I gently flex them in the direction to straighten them and leave them to cool with some weights on top. Depending on how badly the parts are warped, you may need to repeat the process a couple of times. To assist with painting the pieces, I'm using some painting clips from the Scale Modeler's Supply. The steel wire threads have a tendency to fray at the ends, so to prevent this from happening, I add a small drop of solder to the end of each clip. Now I can press them into the foam without the ends coming apart. As much as I like the red walls, I think the colour scheme could look a little bit better for a lighthouse. Vallejo white primer is used on all the parts that will eventually be painted in an off-white colour. As for the lighthouse tower, when the seam lines were scraped away, it left a smooth area. To bring back some texture, I missed some spray paint over the model from a distance. As a result, the paint partially dries as it comes into contact with the model and creates a rough texture on the surface. Once happy with the overall texture, I prime the tower with white primer. Some of the textured paint particles stand out a bit too far for HO scale, so I very lightly sand them back until the texture is a little more uniform. Now all the main parts can be painted using Vallejo Off-White. You'll likely need to thin the Vallejo paint quite a bit before spraying it through the airbrush. The rest of the details are painted with Tamiya Light Grey. Masking can be a bit of a challenge at times. Luckily all the areas that needed masking on this model were in easy to reach places. The frames were painted a nice dull red. I didn't want the colour to be too bright and Vallejo Fire Red seemed to look good. Painting the roof to look more three dimensional and more realistic was done by painting individual tiles a particular grey colour. Trying to randomly apply the colours across the roof without it looking like a pattern. The entire roof was then sprayed with the Vallejo Dark Sea Grey. The coat was thin enough that the different coloured tiles were noticeable under the Dark Sea Grey colour. The same process was applied to the rock foundations. Four different beige colours were applied randomly to individual stones, and then over the top a thinned down stone grey was applied. To further accentuate the stonework, a black wash was liberally applied over the top and then excess wash was wiped away from the top of the stones, leaving a small amount in the mortar lines. The rest of the parts are painted a dark sea grey colour. Just be sure to carefully mask the lighthouse watch room and be sure to avoid getting paint on the inside surfaces when painting. Now that everything has been painted, we can start assembling the lighthouse. To me, uh, extra thin cement was used to glue the model together and the windows were press fit into position.
Just remember to install the LED before gluing the top of the lighthouse together. Window curtains are supplied in the kit and do a great job of hiding the bare interior. Black paper is also included to prevent viewers from being able to see right through the building, but if you use the curtains you won't need to use the paper. Lighthouses tend to be well maintained, but a small amount of weathering can go a long way. And these weathering chalks go a long way as well, so you'll only need a very small amount on your brush to get the desired effect. Try to imagine where rust and dirt may build up, and then what would happen if it rained and started to wash the dirt and rust away. That's where I try to add the effects like rust streaking and grime. A dusting of light mud is applied around the base of the entire building. It's a very thinned down mixture. That way I only apply a very light coat and I can gradually build up the colour in stages until I'm happy. It's hard to see but it is there and it makes a big difference when comparing the before and after. Additional detail and improvements are added using the Anycubic 3D printer. I've used this printer quite a lot to add details to models and I'm using it again on this one to improve the chimney which I built and designed using Tinkercad. You can also download the 3D file from my website if you'd like to print one out for yourself. Some stairs were also downloaded from Thingiverse and printed which will be used a little bit later. Once the parts are printed and washed the supports are removed, any imperfections are sanded away and the part is painted and weathered the desired colour. For the chimney I used Vallejo Rust and some dirty yellow weathering powder. Grimy black powder was also weathered near the top and inside the chimney as well. To create the base for the diorama I'm using extruded foam board. I pretty much use this as the base for most of my dioramas as it's strong and rigid but also lightweight which is perfect. Once I have a general idea of how the scene will be laid out I cut the foam to size. I then create a frame out of pine and glue the foam to the inside of the frame using polyurethane glue. Polyurethane glue expands so you'll need to weigh and clamp the pieces to ensure they don't move as the glue sets. The main landform is going to be made using expanded polystyrene. It's a little cheaper than the yellow foam board and it cuts much easier with the hot wire foam tools. The basic composition of the scene is copied onto the white foam and the foam is then clamped together and I use a hot knife to carve out the general shape of the terrain. I'm not worried about it being perfect as it will eventually be covered in rock moulds and plaster. Before gluing the foam to the base I first roughen the surface so the glue gets a good strong bond. I again use polyurethane glue to glue the foam together. Make sure to weigh it down as the glue sets again to prevent the parts moving as the glue expands and cures. To create the rocky cliff face I'm going to need plenty of rocks. I'm using a mixture of Woodland Scenics rock moulds as well as some knock rock moulds. To attach the rocks to the diorama, I first wet the rock mould. I then use some more plaster of Paris to act as a glue. It gets liberally applied to the back of the mould and then the rock is pressed into position. I work from one end to the other right along the diorama. I'm not too worried about gaps at this stage as they will be filled later. The stairs are also blended into the scene with some plaster of Paris. To hide all those larger gaps I fill them with more plaster of Paris. Again just be sure to pre-wet the area so the plaster bonds well to the rock moulds. After the plaster has had some time to begin to harden I come back in with a small pick and start to chip away at the plaster we used to fill the gaps 
to make it look more jagged and rocky. Try to match up existing fault lines from the rock moulds and connect them together to the adjacent rocks. That way you'll get a much more realistic rock face and it will be nearly impossible to see where the original rock moulds begin and end. The rest of the landform is made using Sculptor Modeling Mix. Basically it's another version of Sculptor Mold and it's perfect for modeling small hills and undulating terrain. After it has been applied, I continue to work the plaster with the spatula until it starts to set and I'm left with a nice smooth surface. I like to make it smooth so I have the option later to add walking tracks and roads. Rough dirt texture will be added later. Any overhanging plaster that protrudes over the edges is cleaned up. To seal the surface in preparation for adding the water effects, I use some Woodland Scenics Flex Paste. This gets applied liberally over any areas of foam and anywhere that resin will be poured. The paste helps seal any holes and also creates a barrier between the foam and resin. I use a stippling motion to help avoid having obvious brush strokes being visible. Any rock outcroppings can be fixed into position with tacky glue. As for painting the rocks, I use six different colors and the airbrush. Step one is the darker base layer of Vallejo Sea Grey. It's applied near the base of the cliff. Just be sure to get it from all angles so you're not left with any bare white spots. Step two is Vallejo Light Grey that is applied to the upper areas of the cliff face. Step 3 adds colour variation between the light and dark grey. I use Vallejo Rust and blended it in where the two greys meet. I also add splashes of rust randomly in spots across the cliff face. Step 4. Vallejo Deck Tan is applied like a wash across the entire cliff face, focusing in a top-down motion to help highlight the top surfaces of the rocks with smaller localized areas of heavier application for additional variation in color. Step 5 is Vallejo Black. Applied in a similar fashion to the deck tan, however there is more of a focus to apply this color to indicate shadows on the bottom of the rocks and in the cracks and valleys. It's thinned down quite a lot and only applied in a very thin layer. Lastly, step six is a dry brushing of Vallejo Silver Grey. Using a large brush with soft bristles works well for this job. Just make sure to only have a very small amount of paint on the brush as you gently drag it across the rock face. It's easy to add more color, but if you add too much, it's very hard to remove. The stairs get exactly the same treatment as the rest of the rocks. Before adding the dirt texture, I paint the surface an earthy brown colour. This will, for the most part, be covered, however if any small areas of dirt texture are missed, it won't be so obvious. The ocean floor is first painted a dark navy blue, making sure to leave no white spots. I apply it right up to the base of the cliff and use a small brush to help get paint into the tight spots without getting blue paint onto the nicely painted rocks. Depth is simulated by painting the sea various shades of blue, green and grey. There's no exact science, I just add variations randomly until I have something that looks natural. Keep in mind that most of this will be hidden with white water so it doesn't need to be perfect. To make the dirt texture, I use some dry dirt from the yard. The larger rocks and twigs get sifted out. To lighten the dirt colour, I add some beige coloured grout until I get the colour I'm after. When glue is applied, it will dry much darker. To ensure the dirt sticks to the slopes and hills, I first apply some diluted Mod Podge and then apply the dirt to the desired areas. I first apply a coarse mix of dirt with some larger rocks in it and then over the top a fine grade of dirt is applied through a stocking. This fine layer helps blend in the larger rocks.
A lighter colour of fine dirt texture is applied to any areas where walking tracks and dirt roads will be. It's applied the same way through a stocking. Before applying a layer of glue, I make sure to dust away any dirt from areas that I don't want it, like the stairs, some areas of the rock face, and from the seabed. The glue I'm using to fix the dirt is a homemade mix of one part Mod Podge and three parts water with a drop of dish soap. Isopropyl alcohol is first applied as this helps the glue soak into the dirt giving a much more permanent layer that isn't easily damaged. Now it's just left to dry for a couple of hours. Before I can add any greenery, I first need to create a mask for the building. That way I can easily add grass right up to where the walls of the building will be and there's no risk of damaging the building with the static grass applicator. The applicator I'm using is a Nock Grassmaster 2.0 along with some Nock Static Grass Glue. And the grass I'm using is a mixture of greens from Nock and Mini Nature. To add the static grass, simply use a brush to apply the glue in the desired areas. I work in small sections at a time to avoid having the glue dry before I've had a chance to add the static grass. The first layer of grass is a mixture of 6mm static grass. Excess grass is removed by turning the diorama upside down and tapping on the base. You could also use a vacuum if turning the model upside down isn't an option. Just be sure to collect the excess grass for use on other areas of the model. Using the end of a paintbrush, I tease the grass to give it an uneven wild grass look. I keep working around the model until all the desired areas are covered. To help blend between the 6mm grass and the dirt, I add areas of 2mm static grass to the edges. The same method is used to apply the 2mm grass as I did with the 6mm grass. I make sure to apply grass randomly around the edges of the building as well. Additional variations of green are added with some Woodland Scenics coarse turf, burnt grass and blended turf. Once happy, I make sure to dust away the stray bits of grass and foam and then apply a layer of glue. Again, I first add the isopropyl alcohol before applying the glue mixture. Before adding resin, I clean up the edges with sandpaper and wipe the dust away. To create the dam for the resin, I use painter's grade masking tape. Make sure it's well and truly pressed onto the diorama to prevent leaks. Excess tape is then removed and the edges of the tape are sealed with wood glue. It's important to ensure the diorama is on a level surface before adding the resin. A tool like the Micromark Digital Level works perfectly for finding level spots. For this model I'm using Envirotex Light and some blue and burnt umber pigments. Envirotex Light is really easy to use. It gets mixed in a 50-50 ratio of hardener and resin. I highly recommend reading the instructions to ensure you get the desired results. When it comes to adding colour, add small amounts at a time. The pigments are quite powerful and it doesn't take much to get the colour you want. When pouring the resin, I try not to pour it any deeper than about 5 to 8 millimetres at a time. The resin can get quite warm as it cures, and the deeper the pour is, the hotter it will get. And given that we have a foam base, I don't want it to get too hot. Bubbles are easily removed with a soldering torch like this. Just remember that scenery doesn't like a hot flame, so be very careful that you avoid directing the flame towards any dry scenery material like the static grass and ground foams. While the resin cures, I don't want any dust to land on it, so it gets covered with a box. About 24 hours later, and it should be cured and hard enough to remove the tape from the sides. 
Extra detail can be added using a variety of methods. Bronze wire like this can be used to create some handrails along the cliff site near the stairs. Barriers along the roadside and walkways are made with some strip wood that have been coloured with a black leather dye and alcohol. I mark out the locations for each post, drill a small hole and glue them into position. The chain between each post is 40 links per inch necklace chain. It's weathered using ferric chloride which is highly corrosive and needs to be handled with caution. The chain doesn't need to be left in for long before it's nicely weathered and it gets dipped in water to wash away the excess ferric chloride. A small drop of glue on top of each post is all that's needed to hold the chain in place. Once you get to the end, the remaining chain is cut. As the lighthouse has an LED in it, I need to run the wires down through the diorama. Using the hot wire tools makes this job very easy. The building gets held into position with Helmar SuperTAC adhesive around its perimeter. The base is blended with the dirt texture and gets glued down with the alcohol and scenic glue mixture. Highlights along the dirt road and the walking paths are made using yellow ochre pastel and a soft brush. It gets dusted along the wheel tracks and any high traffic areas and walking spots. Bushes and shrubs are also added. This is a salt bush tree found locally in South Australia, but any dry twigs with a fine branch structure will work. Other bushes and small trees are added using seafoam material with foliage added. To see exactly how these are made, you can check out the video Realistic Gum Trees using Seafoam. To add the seawater effects, I'm using two products from Woodland Scenics, Water Ripples and Water Waves. The larger waves are added by applying the Water Ripples product liberally to the surface of the resin. It will initially find its own level as it's applied to the surface, however I continue to cover the entire area. Once the Ripples product has had about 30 minutes to an hour to begin to harden, it will start to hold its shape as it's manipulated. I keep working it gently and build up larger waves as the product begins to dry. Just be patient and give it some time as the product won't hold the wave shape straight away, but it will after a while. The white water is made using the Waves product, some white gesso, and knock snow. The snow and waves gel are blended together to make a thick paste. Once you have sufficiently thick paste, a small amount of white gesso is added to give the paste a white tint. Only a small amount is needed as I want the foam to be slightly translucent and I don't want it to be a stark white color. The paste can then be applied and shaped to resemble a broken wave. It can be built up quite high to form a wave or stippled out to be level with the surface. Using a brush will help blend between the built up areas of the wave and the rest of the water underneath. The paste can be pushed around and manipulated for about 30 minutes before it starts to set. Before I call the model complete, I add some last minute details like some birds and I also paint the sides black to neaten up the edges. I hope you enjoyed watching and don't forget if you want to help support the channel be sure to check out my Patreon page where I have some special perks for patrons. Cheers and thanks for watching.